Deutschland class pocket battleship. Displacement 16,200 tons. Propulsion 8 MAN diesel engines producing 56,800 horsepower. Speed 26 knots. Range 9,000 miles at 19 knots. Protection Maximum armor 5 inches. Principal armament, 6 11-inch guns. Crew, 1,150. After the bloody battles of World War I, the Allies all signed the Treaty of Versailles, which tried to prevent Germany starting a new capital ship race by limiting her ships to 10,000 tons displacement and mounting 11-inch guns. But in May 1931, Germany flouted the treaty by launching its latest fighting ship, called the Deutschland. It was the forerunner of a completely new class of ship known as Panzer Schiff, or Pocket Battleship. It's interesting, the ship was laid down before Hitler came into power, so, and, it, and it stretched the Versailles Treaty. It shows how far Germany was already interested in moving to a more military standing. And it was this military standing that the Pocket Battleship stood for. Armed with six Krupp 11-inch guns that could hurl a 739-pound shell nearly 40,000 yards, and capable of a top speed of 26 knots, made this class of battleship a fearsome fighter. By 1934, two more Deutschland-class ships had been launched, the Admiral Scheer and the Graf Spee. The secret of the pocket battleship's speed and power was the innovative design of making the ship lighter. By using diesel engines instead of steam turbines and an electrically welded hull, the Deutschland-class was able to cruise over 12,500 miles equal to halfway around the world. It sent shivers of fear throughout the Allied navies. It had pretty good speed. It had a, a weapons package that made it very tricky for any cruiser to handle, and enough speed that it could outrun pretty much any, any of the existing uh, dreadnoughts that were still around. The Admiral Graf Spee was the pride of the German navy. Even before the Second World War had begun, she was central to secret plans for a guerre de course, a war against commerce at sea. A special ship would need a special captain. The man chosen was one of the best and most highly respected officers in the German Navy, Captain Hans Langsdorff. The great thing about Langsdorff was that he was a very gentlemanly officer. He was a very old-style naval officer. Langsdorff's Graf Spee was nicknamed a pocket battleship. It was boasted that she was bigger than anything faster, and faster than anything bigger. Her newly designed diesel engines allowed her to cruise for 16,000 miles without refueling. Bristling with huge 11-inch guns, she was capable of sinking ships 15 miles away. My father must have been really proud and happy to be on such a beautiful ship. Not only beautiful to look at, but great in every way. On August the 21st, 1939, Graf Spee sailed quietly away from her base in Wilhelmshaven, Germany. On board were 1,134 crew. Her departure was carefully timed so that she would cross the main shipping lanes at night without being spotted. When Britain declared war on September the 3rd, Germany already had an ace hiding in the Atlantic. Her orders were to act as a lone surface raider and to wreak havoc with Allied merchant shipping. Langsdorff's intention was to create as much chaos as he could. So he'd sink something somewhere and then motor away as fast as he could somewhere else to give the impression there was more than one ship and to create as much chaos as possible. In fact, the main aim was not so much the physical damage that was involved in sinking the ships. It was the whole chaos that was inflicted on shipping in this broad area, shipping that was of crucial importance to Britain's survival in the war. On September the 30th, 
Graf Spee sank the British steamship Clement, but she got off a radio message warning that she was being attacked. News of an unidentified German raider in the South Atlantic was met with swift action at the Admiralty. With merchant shipping vital to the war effort, Churchill made the German raider his number one target. Twenty warships were dispatched to hunt her down. In a deadly game of cat and mouse, Langsdorff continued to hunt Allied merchant shipping. To cause the maximum confusion possible, he now also began to disguise his ship, adding a fake gun turret and an extra funnel. He played his sister ships. In the South Atlantic, he was the Admiral Scheer. In the Indian Ocean, he was the Admiral Graf Spee. He made the Allies think there were a, n a number of German raiders around when there was only one. He played this game, and I think he enjoyed it. Aber er hatte also wohl bei dieser ganzen Kreuzerfahrt auch also. Apparently, during the entire trip, he took great delight in avoiding being found by the English ships. To me, doing that seems almost boyish, even though he was 45 years old by then. Graf Spey next intercepted the Newton Beach, a British merchant ship. To keep his position secret, Langsdorff ordered the merchantman not to use the radio to report his presence, or he'd open fire. He then transferred her crew to the Graf Bay before sinking their ship. On October the 7th, the Ashley, carrying 7,300 tons of sugar, was sent to the bottom. Again, Langsdorff transferred her crew to the Graf Bay. He was worried about the fate of the crews of the ships he sank. And he would, he would compromise his own position in order to secure the lives of the crews that he'd sunk. In fact, one very touching thing is the way that when ships would not obey his orders and still signal and he would shoot at them, he would congratulate the officers at the end to say, you did the right thing. Throughout October and November, Langsdorff led the British a merry dance around the South Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. He continued to sink merchant shipping, but insisted on saving lives. Hans Langsdorff had a wonderful cruiser war. Hans Langsdorff conducted an outstanding cruiser war, which in the form it took was unique in naval war history. Unique because he fulfilled his task as a merchant raider als Handelsstörer zu wirken und durch den Einsatz der Schiffe And yet, during the deployment of the ship, not a single human life was lost. Verloren gegangen. Because Graf Spee was a lone raider, thousands of miles from home, Langsdorff had strict orders from Berlin not to attack other warships. Hitler did not want to risk losing his prize asset. But these were orders that went against the grain for an old-school officer like Langsdorff. In his heart of hearts, he considered this somehow insulting, which was clearly shown by what he said. And my father also thought it dishonorable to attack a much weaker opponent who had no chance of defense at all. Graf Spee had been at sea for three months and was coming to the end of her patrol. Langsdorff was eager to win a significant victory over a British warship before returning to Germany. It is precisely because Graf Spee is disappearing from the South Atlantic and it cannot be foreseen when a second commerce raider can operate here that it must be perceived to have achieved an objectively significant success before leaving the area. You can see from the war diary that Langsdorff was getting very frustrated at just sinking merchant ships. He wanted a victory over the British before he went home. By early December, Commodore Harwood's cruiser Exeter and his two light cruisers Ajax and Achilles 
were patrolling the South American coast between Brazil and the Falkland Islands. Harwood, a tactical expert, had a hunch as to where Langsdorff might eventually be found. The idea had come to him on a day out with his wife. At the World Trade Fair, he was transfixed by a map which showed the shipping routes in the South Atlantic and how they all focused on the plate. And he was so transfixed that Mother, had, who was there at the time, had great difficulty in, in getting him away from it. On December the 2nd, Graf Bay sank the steamship Doric Star, but not before she was able to send the emergency code signal announcing she was being attacked. Excuse me, sir. We just had a For the first time, Harwood now knew where the German raider was. I got here a, a rough diagram which our uh, father made in making his plans for where uh, Grass Bay was after sinking Dyke Star and various calculations of her speed and probable speeds and range and where she'd get to. And uh, he had three options. One was to go to Rio, where he'd get on the 12th. One to the plate for the 13th. Or to Falkland Islands on the 14th. So it's quite an interesting little bit of paper, which he sent home to Mother saying, keep it, it is of interest. Harwood's thinking that Langsdorff would head for the River Plate is one of the most classic examples of inspired intuition, I think, in naval history. He knew from his experience that the River Plate was a focal point, that if there was a German raider in the area, which it looked as if there was because of the sinkings, then it was more than likely he would come to the River Plate. There was no code breaking, there was no intelligence, this was just inspired professional instinct and he was absolutely right. On December the 7th, Graf Bay sank the merchantman Strayonshau and captured secret documents that revealed Allied convoys were forming off the mouth of the River Plate. It was the opportunity for a major victory that Langsdorff had been looking for. And he was the assumption that these convoys he presumed that these convoys were protected by one or two destroyers. But he didn't reckon on finding Admiral Harwood's squadron there. Graf Spee headed towards the River Plate. Although neither Langsdorff nor Harwood knew it, they were now just 20 miles apart. There was tension building up in the ship. I mean, we knew that it was a German raider, and um, they were a modern ship. And um, the equipment we had was the same sort of equipment that they had in the First World War. It was um, fairly hit and miss stuff. This was in the early morning and. It was in the early hours of the morning, and the commander was asleep in the tower cabin. And when the tops of the masts could be made out, the commander was woken and the alarm was sounded. Alarm. I don't think the sailors had even got their breakfast from the galley when something was sighted and uh, they sounded off action stations on the bugle. And I can feel the cold shiver now, <laughs> even sitting here. Um, I felt then, um, what are we, what's going to happen? Because we're all snarling and abusing, whose joke is this? The commander's being funny. We all turned out until somebody screaming, it's the real thing, it's the real thing. The messenger went down to Father in his cabin and said, I think I've heard that one before. But nevertheless, he put his uniform on over his pyjamas, went up to the bridge and was there all day. He waited for a moment and then it became increasingly clear that these were warships. To begin with, he had assumed them to be destroyers. And then he said very calmly, OK, let's do it. 
The key moment is when Langsdorff sights three British warships. He chooses to engage. He knows that that's going against his basic orders not to engage warships, but he thinks that the time has come to do it. He could have got away. His diesel engines allowed him to accelerate away in the opposite direction. He chose deliberately not to. Had he realized in time that he was faced with three cruisers, he certainly would not have engaged in battle. It sounds very unfair, really, three ships versus one, and, uh, but yet the one ship has the advantage. But you can see clearly from here why it does. It has got six guns that can fire these huge 670-pound shells. One of these hitting you, you know about it, as Exeter particularly found out. Whereas the British ships, the two smaller ones with the six-inch shells, they can spew out large numbers of these, but clearly the effect of 100 pounds hitting you is going to be a good deal less than the effect of 670 pounds hitting you. All the British can hope to do is to peck their enemies to death. But Harwood had a brilliantly simple plan, which now came into its own. He was convinced that his smaller ships could beat a pocket battleship by using a simple strategy. He would split his ships into two flanks, thus forcing Graf Spee to make choices as to which side to fire at, effectively halving her firepower. Poor old Graf Spee, throughout the Battle of the River Plate, is firing at one ship and then at the other two ships. One ship, the other two ships. Its, its attention is entirely split. And that worked absolutely brilliantly. Harwood's tactics of dividing his ships were revolutionary at the time, but the plan called for the Exeter to head straight for Graf Spee. This exposed her to the full fury of Langsdorff's 11-inch guns. In the battle that followed, Exeter took seven direct hits. Some of us were directed up to the bridge area where a shell had passed through what was known as the uh, remote control office. And the people there were cut to ribbons. And we had to sort of, uh, really, I suppose, put people together. You know, you, you, and, well, it's difficult to sort of talk about it, I suppose. But there was a, a body here and an arm over there. And you knew that that arm belonged to that body because he had the right uh, buttons on his sleeve. The Exeter was now a limping wreck. Amazingly, Graf Spee did not move in to sink her and bring Langsdorff the victory he had sought. But for Kurt Diggins, the answer lies in Langsdorff's character. He didn't pursue the Exeter because the Exeter had been rendered unfit for combat. And it's possible that his own personal attitude played a part here, too. Why sink a ship if it would entail six or seven hundred men losing their lives? Graf Spee now turned her guns on Harwood's other two ships. Seven men were killed on Ajax, four more on Achilles. When you hear them land, it's an almighty percussion. Because we're down below on a deck, and as you come down below, there's a steel hatch, and there's a steel hatch there is around about two foot six square, I suppose, yeah, that we went down through, and it with a wire up lid, and that clang stopped, and you were shut in down there. I often thought afterwards, you know, it came to you, then there's fear after. Hell, what if something had happened? How the hell were we ever going to get out of there? At 7.40, after 80 minutes of ferocious battle, Harwood ordered the Ajax and Achilles to break off the action under a smoke screen. To Harwood's surprise, Langsdorff didn't pursue, but instead turned Graf Spee away. Accurate British firing had taken its toll on the German ship. 
The impact was recorded by one of Langsdorff's officers. Above deck, they have punished us severely. What one sees there is disastrous. When from my control station I have to go to the command post or to one of the gun turrets, I have to cross the chief first aid post. The floor is running with blood. It made a huge impression on him. There's one of those pictures of him standing there, his head bare, wearing a coat, receiving the first reports. He then walked through the ship and visited the hospital below deck, where the injured and also some of the dead were laid. And this made a profound impression on him. Having finished his inspection of the damage, Langsdorff decided that his ship urgently needed repairs. He headed for the nearest major port, Montevideo, in neutral Uruguay. It was a move that would have grave consequences. Langsdorff telegraphed Berlin, explaining his fateful decision. 36 killed, 5 seriously wounded, 53 slightly wounded. As ship cannot be made seaworthy for breakthrough to the homeland with means on board, decided to go into the river plate at risk of being shut in there. On December 14, 1939, the people of Montevideo awoke to a startling sight in their harbor, the German warship Graf Spee. Farther out, two British warships faced the double challenge of bottling up a superior foe and the world's largest estuary. With the Exeter limping for the Falkland Islands, only the Ajax and Achilles were left. But they were each alone, patrolling separate channels of the 120-mile estuary. They'd seen what had happened to the Exeter, and they knew that in any one-to-one -one confrontation, that both they and their ships would be ripped apart by the vastly superior firepower of the Germans. Both ships were low on fuel and short of ammunition. The men were unslept and on their nerves. The Graf's Bay was right here in Montevideo Harbor. British hopes rested not on warships, but a diplomat. Eugene Millington Drake, Britain's ambassador to Uruguay. He was descended from one of the greatest sailors of all time, Sir Francis Drake. Now, he masterminded a plan worthy of his brilliant ancestor. Under international law, if a freighter left a neutral harbor, a belligerent warship couldn't follow for 24 hours. By releasing a British freighter every 24 hours, Millington Drake could delay the Graf Spee's departure until reinforcements arrived, or he ran out of freighters. But time was his enemy. The Dorsetshire and Neptune were five days away. The Ark Royal and Renown were four days away. Only the Cumberland might arrive in time. With no more cards to play, the Royal Navy blocked. The BBC announced the fleet was already approaching the River Plate. They hoped the phony broadcast would keep the Graf Bay in Montevideo until real help arrived. When the Exeter at last limped into the Falklands, the wounded were looked after by the islanders. On the morning of December 15th, Langsdorff had his own dead to bury. 37 sailors killed in the same battle. The funeral made news in Montevideo and around the world. As soon as the Graf Spee had dropped anchor, reporters flocked to cover it. The battleship was a big story and it promised to get bigger. For the first time in history, Millions followed a war story as it unfolded, minute by minute. Now, what will be the fate of the British Navy? One item in particular caught the attention of Berlin. Oh. 
At the funeral, every German gave the Nazi Heil Hitler, except Langsdorff. He gave the old Imperial Navy salute. It wouldn't be the last time Langsdorff displeased Berlin. Right now, he had bigger problems. British agents had covertly photographed his ship. The mystery of why she suddenly broke off the battle was now solved. Desperate to keep weight down, the Graf Spee's builders had left her armor too thin. During the battle, 18 British shells struck the Graf Spee with devastating effect. They opened holes in her deck and hull, including one four feet wide. Several guns were knocked out. Worst of all, the onboard refinery that turned crude oil into fuel was damaged. Without it, Langsdorff could never make the long voyage back to Germany for repairs. Instead, he headed for the nearest port, Montevideo. He needed two weeks to make his ship seaworthy and battle ready. But he was fighting the clock and the British ambassador. Armed with new information, Millington Drake now urged Uruguay to expel the Graf Spee. Uruguay agreed. It ordered the warship to leave port, otherwise Uruguay would seize her. And if seized, she would likely fall into the hands of the British. Under orders from the Uruguayan government, a news relation to leave port while diplomats conferred the world wondered. Would the Graf Spee go to sea and fight, or would she surrender? The captain of the Graf Spee, Hans Langsdorff, alone would decide. On December 17th, with the ultimatum hanging over him, Langsdorff made up his mind. That evening, thousands came down to the River Plate for a showdown. The Graf Spee was about to make a break for it. Beyond the harbor lay the Ajax and Achilles, now reinforced by the Cumberland. The stage was set. The Palazzo Salvo is the tallest building in Montevideo. From its heights, British agents had kept an eye on the Graf Spee. Now, they had the best seat in the house for the last act in the drama. Watching from this balcony here was Sir Eugene Millington Drake, the man whose diplomatic cunning had drawn the noose on the beleaguered German battleship. In the fading evening light, the three British cruisers could be seen out there upon the horizon. In the harbor, the Graf Spee was preparing for departure At 6.15, three quarters of a million people watched the Graf Spee leave. Around the world, millions more waited for the sound of her guns. They would never hear them. Out of sight of the crowds, two Argentine tugs pulled up on Longsdorf's order and removed most of the Graf Spee's crew. Three miles farther out, the remaining crewmen abandoned the Graf Spee, now stuffed to the gunwales with explosives. At 8.54 p.m., two wires on the hands of a clock touched. A suicide ship, blown up by her own captain, surrenders to the sea. A blaze from bow to stern, the Admiral Graf Spee is scuttled. Longsdorf's fateful decision was to save his men. The next day, Longsdorf's crew reached Buenos Aires. For scuttling his ship without a fight, Longsdorf was called a coward by the Argentine press. In fact, he intended to go down with his ship, but his officers begged him not to for the sake of his men. 
Langsdorff took his crew across the River Plate to Buenos Aires. On arrival, he was branded a coward by the press for not taking the fight back to the British, even though the odds were against him. When he landed in Buenos Aires, he came under great pressure from the press as to why had he come to Buenos Aires. And the pressures on the man must have been absolutely unbearable. He knew that on his personal decision, he had thrown away one of the German Navy's greatest assets. That instead of a victory, he'd suffered a defeat. And it was understandable, therefore, that he would decide that there was only one way out. Saying goodbye to me in Montevideo when I was transferred, he said, say hello to Germany for me, say hello to my family. There's a lot in that sentence. That was a truly moving moment for me when he said this and said goodbye. On December the 19th, Langsdorff gathered his crew together in Buenos Aires and assured them that they were now safe and would be looked after. That evening, he joined fellow officers in the senior ratings mess of the Arsenal building where they had been stationed. He was said to have been at ease and in good spirits. He then retired to his room and wrote a letter home to his family. It would be his last. Now, deep down inside me, I am happy and content. Everything is being prepared and I have the peace and quiet in which to write you this letter to bid you farewell and thank you. If this is God's will, then I shall cheerfully meet my death, despite life having been so dear to me, because it gave me all that it had to offer. Then there are some very personal lines. And then in conclusion, my father writes, be proud in your grief and prove yourself to be a true soldier's wife. Give my love to Jochen and Inga. And then his signature. It still moves me. Sometime in the early hours of the morning, Captain Hans Langsdorff shot himself. The captain of the pocket battleship Graf Spee was buried with full naval honors in Buenos Aires. His officers and crew were joined by Argentine armed forces in forming a guard of honor through the streets. German and Argentine dignitaries stood next to representatives of the British merchant sailors whose lives Langsdorff had spared. The Battle of the River Plate was the first great media event of the Second World War. The world looked on as Langsdorff made his fateful decisions. Many branded him a coward for not leaving Montevideo with all guns blazing. I think in a way, Langsdorff was more heroic doing what he did than going out and immolating himself at the hands of the British. Because Langsdorff was very conscious that the young men in his crew should not pay the price for his error, for his disobedience, for his mistake. I maintain that Langsdorff's decision was the correct one at the time that it was the correct one later on, and that it remains the correct one today. A thousand men owe their life to Langsdorff. And that's all folks, hope you enjoyed this episode about the Deutschland-class Panzerships, and in particular the pocket battleship, the Graf Spee. Anyways, if you like what I'm doing, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more episodes in the upcoming days and weeks. Anyways, aside from that, have a wonderful day and see you all on the high seas.